Welcome to the 23rd century, a time when the Milky Way has been divided into factions, the insect-like terminids, the robotic automatons, and humans who may have begun a galactic war. At the heart of the conflict lies Super Earth, the jewel of the Milky Way, a land of prosperity, liberty, and managed democracy. A utopia, really, that must be defended at all costs. At least, that's the narrative I've been given. Fortunately, we're citizens of neither this time nor this dimension, and our true reason for coming here is far less... Political? Yes, that's it. Our mission will take us to the Umlaut Sector, a region known for its high presence of Terminids. Thanks to the heavily restricted information coming from Super Earth, little is known of their biology. That is, until now. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I am Dr. Felix Nebula, and to you I say, welcome aboard the dimension-hopping bioship Manta. Now, our dear traveler, we're about to take off, and if we stay on schedule, we'll make it home before Liberty Day. Region of High Terminid Activity located. Descending to Meridia. Thank you, Manta. Please keep all sensors engaged. This planet is currently the home of a Terminid super colony, and we don't want to upset the locals. Now, as Manta searches for a suitable landing zone, allow me to provide some history. The exact circumstances surrounding the first contact between Super Earth and the Terminids are unclear. Some historical accounts suggest that the Terminids, then simply referred to as bugs, were the first alien race to make peaceful contact with humanity. These claims are heavily disputed by historians, however, and the true nature of the initial encounter is still a matter of debate. What we do know is that at some point, either before or during the First Galactic War, Super-Earth discovered that dead Terminid bodies decayed into an oil-like substance called Element 710. And at this point, the relationship between the two species shifted completely. Element 710, you see, is an extremely potent and energy-dense substance and is a crucial element in fueling Super Earth's faster-than-light drives. How crude. Yes, nothing so sophisticated as your biomachinery, to be certain. Now, given the lack of unmoderated information, the exact causes and timeline of the war itself are subject to interpretation, but it is clear that the First Galactic War had enormous consequences for both species. Super Earth launched military campaigns against the Terminids, seeking to establish dominance and secure access to their beloved Element 710. Meanwhile, the Terminids, who were initially ill-prepared for the confrontation, were forced to adapt rapidly. Eventually, Super Earth emerged as the victor of the First Galactic War, and the bugs were largely subjugated, enslaved, and confined to specific planets where they were farmed for the production of Element 710. This next part is highly classified on Super Earth, but have no fear, dear traveler. Super Earth has no jurisdiction here. For now. Anyway, besides farming the species, scientists also conducted extensive genetic experiments, and through many generations, managed to reduce Terminid intelligence and increase their yield of Element 710. They did much more than that, Doctor. Their testing led to a nearly complete restructuring of their social system and- Yes, yes, you're very correct, but we'll explore that in due time. In reality, we know very little about the extent of these modifications, but we do have a theory as to the primary catalyst, a neurotoxic chemical compound designed as a form of pest control, so to speak. The Federation of Super Earth described termicide as a miracle compound, lethal to terminids, but harmless to other forms of life. But while the compound does target the terminid nervous system, causing rapid paralysis and death in most cases, it quickly became clear that it was also mutagenic. Manta, could you give us a definition? <laughs> A mutagen is a physical or chemical agent that causes a permanent change in an organism's DNA or genetic material. Exactly. And again, we'll return to these changes soon. For now, suffice it to say that the rumors of termicide's side effects were squashed. But eventually, the Terminids broke out of their confinements and invaded Super-Earth space. Though the Terminids were not the only point of conflict, this was the beginning of the Second Galactic War. And in fact, Meridia, the planet we're currently descending upon, is a particularly interesting example of what has been happening across the galaxy in recent times. 
You see, Meridia was once a lush biome, a far cry from the wasteland we see now. In their wisdom, Super Earth designed a way to disperse termicide throughout numerous planets, a network of towers called the Terminid Control System, or TCS. But as we've seen, the effects of termicide are unpredictable. Seemingly overnight, rather than dwindling, the Terminid population on Meridia exploded. It appeared that termicide actually drastically reduced the population's reproductive time and within mere days, the entire planet was written off as a lost cause. That is precisely what makes this the perfect place to begin our survey. And it's also the perfect time. It likely won't be long before Super Earth decides to employ more drastic measures. Descent complete. Scans indicate a very large subterranean population of unidentified organisms. That will be the colony. We'll be approached by a century shortly, I'm certain. Well, that was fast. Here's one now. Excellent. Manta, please use your patented Omnigrab Array to bring one on board. Fascinating. At first glance, Terminids resemble giant insectoids with a segmented body plan and multiple limbs. In fact, Terminids exhibit a blend of characteristics from multiple Earth-based phyla, while simultaneously not fitting in with any previously known classifications. Are they arachnids, crustaceans, insects? The answer really is none of the above. They're aliens. Now, one of the most striking aspects of terminid morphology is the exoskeleton. Like arthropods on Earth, it appears to be composed primarily of hard chitin, which provides incredibly strong protection and structural support. But it's also segmented, with each segment connected by more flexible membranes, which allows for a range of movement and increased agility. But this exoskeleton isn't only valuable to the Terminids themselves. Unfortunately, as previously mentioned, Super Earth has taken a special interest in this species for precisely this reason. You see, as a Terminid begins to decay, many of the proteins, lipids, and complex carbohydrates derived from the soft tissues and organs are broken down, largely by microbial activity. This process releases a variety of organic compounds that interact with the calcium components present in the Terminid exoskeleton. The specific chemical reactions that occur during this process are not fully understood, but it seems that the calcium acts as a catalyst, facilitating the transformation of these organic compounds into element 710 precursors. Is this anything like the process of fossil fuel production on Earth? What a fascinating comparison! As I'm sure you know, fossil fuels, such as oil and natural gas, are formed over eons through the decomposition and transformation of ancient organic matter typically from plants and algae. The production of element 710 in terminids does involve the decomposition and transformation of organic matter, albeit on a much shorter timescale and through a different set of chemical processes. In short, the apparent catalyzing effect of calcium in the terminid exoskeleton sets it apart from the formation of fossil fuels on Earth. Of course, harvesting of element 710 has had profound impacts on terminid biology, as Super Earth's selective breeding programs and genetic modifications intentionally favor individuals with higher Element 710 yields, creating a whole host of genetic traits and offshoots that likely never would have occurred naturally. But even naturally, there is a great variety in the thickness and appearance of the exoskeleton itself, especially between casts. Manta, what cast is this? This appears to be a member of the Warrior cast, specifically what is known as a scavenger. Ah, the perfect starting point for our studies. As previously alluded to, the Terminid society, much like eusocial insects on Earth, is composed of multiple castes, each with different roles in serving the collective. In many ways, eusocial colonies like these can be viewed as superorganisms in themselves. At this time, the known Terminid castes are warrior, hardshell, hunter, and bile. We'll explore each of these in detail, but let's begin with the specimen right in front of us. The warrior caste is the largest and generally consists of soldiers, workers, farmers, and even leaders. Members of this caste appear to assist in the burrowing process by digging, moving dirt, and maintaining the massive underground tunnel networks created to support the hives. This scavenger is considered one of the lowliest of its species, of relatively low intelligence and somewhat defenseless against any decent threat. But what it lacks in power and intelligence, it makes up for in numbers, and any predator can quickly become overwhelmed in a swarm. 
But more than that, scavengers act as an early warning system for the colony. Upon sensing danger, they utilize a novel form of stridulation, somewhat like crickets and grasshoppers on Earth, to emit an ear-splitting warning call, along with a cloud of pheromones, both of which serve to call in reinforcements. Scavengers play other crucial roles as well, such as locating and collecting various types of organic matter, such as dead plant material, fungal growth, and even the carcasses of other organisms. Hmm, this scavenger appears to be the adolescent form of something else. Astounding! I'd say that this is a good time to bring up one major difference between Terminid society and the similar eusocial colonies of Earth. Commonly, in ants, for example, a role is assigned to an adult individual, and they maintain that role until their death. In Terminids, however, it appears that individuals often progress through a series of castes as they molt and grow, which leads me to believe that the warrior caste, at least, is divided primarily based on size. While unusual by our standards, this does allow the Terminid society to be extremely adaptable with the potential for individuals to transition between castes based on the needs of the colony. This could also explain why Super-Earth's experimentation produced such unintended and variable changes. An excellent point. We'll certainly need to explore that in more detail as well. Now, as scavengers continue to molt and grow, they undergo a series of morphological and physiological changes that prepare them for their eventual transition into a new form and triggered by a combination of genetic, hormonal, and environmental factors, such as the availability of food resources and the likelihood of threats. First, their bodies begin to grow and elongate, developing more powerful musculature and specialized appendages. At the same time, their exoskeletons begin to thicken and harden, providing enhanced armor. Finally, there is the development of specialized sensory organs and communication channels allowing them to coordinate their actions and respond quickly to the needs of the colony. Now, without further ado, let's see if we can locate this next form. Manta? Wonderful! This, dear traveler, is the warrior, a truly mighty terminid morph. As I just described, warriors exhibit some impressive adaptations to their new role, but they also exhibit many features common among the terminid species such as the ability to communicate through what appears to be a complex system of pheromones and tactile cues. But what makes warriors a truly interesting case study is a biological trait only known because of their frequent run-ins with Helldivers. You see, when in combat a warrior sustains significant or complete destruction of its head, its body will continue to function for a time, but with a dramatic increase in aggression and attack speed. This is what Helldivers call Berserker Mode. This would suggest a kind of decentralized nervous system, would it not? That's exactly right. It appears that to some extent, Terminids possess a distributed neural architecture, rather than a primary, centralized brain. At least, not as we might expect. A distributed nervous system isn't unheard of even in earthly species, such as the octopus, and in fact, for an intelligent species with many limbs, the ability to respond to tactile stimuli without the need for the signal to travel to a single brain is an immense advantage. Of course, several bundles of nerve cells or ganglia are present in the terminid head, and it appears that once it undergoes significant trauma, a surge of neurotransmitters is triggered from secondary neural centers, leading to a temporary increase in metabolic activity, muscle contractility, and sensory processing. This last stand mechanism likely arose in the warrior castes specifically due to their role as the first line of defense for the colony, and the fact that the behavior doesn't appear in other castes just goes to show how specialized they are. Finally, it appears that this berserker mode could go on for some time, were it not for the severe loss of circulatory fluid, which, by the way, appears to be a fluid plasma similar to hemolymph rather than blood. This is all very fascinating, but I'm curious to know more about the species overall. You make a good point. Before we proceed further, we should discuss a few more absolutely astounding aspects of terminid biology, many of which are unprecedented even in our travels. For an example, as evidenced by the pervasive presence of so-called spore spewers on the planets where we find terminids, it appears that they have a form of symbiotic relationship with an as yet unidentified fungus. This is one area that will require much more study, but as for the nature of this symbiotic relationship, 
I hypothesize that the spores produced by the spewers provide ideal conditions for the production and maintenance of terminid hives, and especially their eggs, even in the harshest environmental conditions. The fungus that grows from these spores creates essentially a microhabitat for the hive, providing nutrients through the enzymatic breakdown of complex organic matter in the environment. Furthermore, the fungal mycelium, as it grows, provides limited structural support for the nests themselves. Finally, the spores, drifting in the wind, essentially act as terraforming agents, creating certain conditions ideal for new terminid colonies and ultimately aiding in the species' planetary expansion. That's a fascinating hypothesis. What does the fungus get out of this relationship? A good question. For the fungus, the benefit of the symbiosis is simple. The hives, tunneled and hollowed out by the terminids, provide a perfect habitat for growth as well as the eventual establishment of new spore spewers. Plus, though spores are an effective means of dispersal, the near-universal presence of spores embedded in the exoskeleton of terminid individuals means that when one species expands, the other does as well. There is much more we could explore here, but in the interest of time, Manta, let's see if we can find another cast for study. Certainly, Doctor. Ah, the perfect transition to the next cast I'd hope to observe. This, dear traveler, is a Charger, a member of the Hardshell cast, an extremely specialized group known for their exceptionally durable exoskeletons. In essence, these are the heavy infantry of the Terminid Hive. The Charger in particular possesses chitinous armor as much as three feet thick in places, making it extremely durable in combat. Their head exhibits either a pointed or crest shape, either of which is devastating in a head-on charge, which, as their name implies, is their primary form of attack. Of course, you may also notice that the Charger's heavily armored limbs could be considered spade-shaped, making them a perfect tool for digging. Though very little is known about the Terminid subterranean society and behaviors, it seems likely that the hardshell cast in general can pull a very effective double duty as burrowers for the hive. Now, it isn't exactly clear where the charger fits into the life cycle of the species. Some have theorized that it is an advanced form of the warrior we saw previously. Given the lack of direct observation, however, others believe that the hardshell cast is produced directly from eggs in response to increased threats to the hive. And in fact, chargers themselves, while formidable, eventually appear to grow to an even larger form, called the behemoth. Doctor, I feel compelled to remind you that we are on a schedule. Good heavens, would you look at the time? My apologies, Traveler, we are due for a brief intermission. But don't worry, we'll continue our exploration of this fascinating species very soon. After all, we have much yet to discover. For example, to what extent did Super Earth's testing affect this species? How do they spread to other planets? And what is bile? For now, we'll ascend to low orbit. In the meantime, rest, refuel, and when you're ready, tap the screen in front of you to select our next adventure. Brace yourselves. Beginning ascent in three, two, one.